Well, good morning, church family. Well, my name is Adam, and I'm the youth and young adult pastor here at First Baptist Surfside, and we're so glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. Um, if you happen to be a guest with us this morning, we'd love it if you fill out one of these Connect cards. Uh, there should be one in the seat back in front of you, and you can do uh, one of two things with that card. Um, either you can drop it off in the offering plate when it comes by, or on your way out after the service, uh, to your left, there's a Connect wall, and there should be some folks there who want to greet you and take that card from you in exchange for a free gift. Uh, just to say thanks for coming to visit with us and worship with us. Uh, and they should also be able to answer any questions you might have about our church family. A few announcements this morning. Uh, first, coming up in just under three weeks is our Easter extravaganza. Uh, this is a great outreach event, for, especially for young families and children. Uh, so <clears throat> that's going to be March 30th. We're going to start at 9 o'clock. And so we need some candy. We need some volunteers. Um, if you have not already signed up to volunteer... There is also in the seat back in front of you a uh, volunteer card, so you can fill it out and check off which area you would like to serve in, uh, and then we'll be in contact pretty soon with volunteers to get you more information. We are going to have a volunteer training on March the 24th, that is Palm Sunday, so it's two weeks from today, volunteer training on March the 24th. It's going to be right after the second service, so you can just kind of hang out here in the sanctuary, uh, and we'll do it then. Also, on Easter Sunday... Here's kind of the, the schedule for that day. Uh, first thing in the morning at 6.45, we're going to do a sunrise service down at the Surfside Pier. This is a great uh, community outreach. We have, it's very well attended from people in the community that don't normally come to the church. Uh, so feel free to, uh, if you show up, talk to somebody you don't know. Uh, invite them back at 8.15 for our breakfast that morning. So we're not going to do any Sunday school or small groups that morning. We're just going to have a church-wide breakfast. It's kind of a drop-in. Come hang out, invite your neighbor, hang out with your uh, Sunday school class, and meet some people you don't normally talk to on Sunday morning. And also at 1030, we'll have a special kids celebration for all the kids from kindergarten through fifth grade as well during the second service. And lastly, our Surfside Community Ministries is going to have an interest meeting today. Uh, it is actually today. I know last week I said it was today, but it is actually today, uh, Sunday, March 10th, which is today. At 11.45, so after the second service is over, just kind of hang out here uh, for a few minutes and then we'll have an interest meeting. So if you are, have any questions about what that ministry is or what it might look like, or if you're interested in serving in some capacity, th uh, this interest meeting is for you. So uh, please feel in to hang out and learn more. This morning I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning only through your son. And you've been so good to us, and we thank you that you are love, that you are holy, and that you are wise. And in your wisdom and in your sovereignty, there are times that we find ourselves in situations that are hard. And sometimes that's our fault, when we sin and when we make foolish choices. And, but sometimes we suffer for doing good, for simply following after Jesus. And we pray this morning that you would strengthen and equip us to endure with gladness and joy in our heart and to be prepared to give a reasonable response to anybody that asks us for a reason for the hope within. And God also help us to remember that Jesus also suffered for doing good so that he might bring us to you. So God, we pray that you would be honored and glorified in this place this morning. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. 
If y'all would, let's stand together as we get into our time of singing praise to the Lord. church family? All right, I know we are running on one less hour of sleep, but let me ask you to do me a favor. Would you smile for me just for a quick moment? <laughs> let me see your teeth for a moment. Most of you look better when you smile. There's a few maybe not, but most of you look a lot nicer when you smile. It's good to have you this morning, and we are just thankful to be able to gather and worship our Savior, and folks, that's something to smile about. That's something to celebrate, and so we just want to welcome you this morning. This month, as a church, we're going to spend a significant amount of time reflecting and remembering the most significant historical moment in all of history. And that is none other than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It stands so monumental in human history that all of history leading up to that moment looked forward to that day. And all of history since then has been lived in light of the ramifications of the resurrection of Jesus. It is through the resurrection that we are here today. It is through the resurrection of our Savior that we have been forgiven, that we have been made new, and we have been granted everlasting life. We have been given so great a salvation 
But for those of us that have been transformed by the gospel, it is not just our own private life. Now we are called in the Great Commission to go therefore and make disciples. So if you have experienced so great a salvation, how could you not want others to experience what you have experienced? Now that looks many different ways in the life of our church, that we are to be about God's mission. But one of the ways we focus on here during Easter is the Annie Armstrong Easter offering that goes to support around roughly 3,000 missionaries, church planners right here in North America. Now I'm going to give you some more details, but before I do that, turn your attention to the screen. When I tell people I'm a missionary, People ask what kind of missionary are you? Or they want to know exactly what it is a missionary does. For a lot of times you'll hear people say, a missionary here? You mean that's a thing? Well, there's 281 million lost people in the U.S. and Canada. So, yeah, it's a thing. But there's one question no one ever asked me, and I wish they would. No one ever asked us where is the finish line. That's the question I want to hear. What does mission accomplish look like? You can watch videos about North American missionaries like me. You can read stories about us and pray for us. But don't get so caught up in the methods and minutia of what we do that you miss the main thing. Everything you see and hear and read about us is really just a means to an end. We start churches to make Jesus known. We meet needs to make Jesus known. We move to unfamiliar places, we meet unreached people, and we attempt unrealistic things just to make Jesus known. There is nothing more important than that. Now, nothing at all. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And so that's what a fish dying looks like. It looks like obedience, same as your finished life. Got spit, you do, we go. Everything stops with your gift, so that any Armstrong is the option. Those gifts enable us to go places where the gospel has never been. This is where we cross our finish line. This is where, together, we make Jesus known. So why do we go? Did you catch the number? North America alone, an estimated 281 million people that still need to hear about the saving gospel message. And what I love about Annie Armstrong is that when we give 100%, every penny that is given goes directly to support 3,000 church planners and North American missionaries. Our church goal you see on the screen is for this month that we would collect $2,500. Now church, I think we can blow that number out of the water personally. But $2,500, and you ask, well, what's my money going to? Well, according to their website, $2,500 would go to allow one church plant to pay their rent for one month, and also on top of that, do two different outreach events to their community. So church, let me just challenge us to go above and beyond and give that we might be a part of taking the gospel to the nations, but also to our nation in North America. As our ushers come down to take our offering, would you join with me as we pray? Jesus, as a church, we talk so much about missions and going on missions and being about God's mission. But Lord, I pray that it would not just be talk, but Lord, you would find us faithful. That we would not just pray, not just give, but Lord, we would go. Lord, I am reminded every person in this room that knows you every single day goes into a unique mission field that I never will. They will encounter people that are hurting and who desperately need Jesus. And so, God, I pray that as a church, you would find us faithful to pray, to give, but also to go and share the love of Christ with those that we come in contact with. God, I pray that you would find us to be a faithful people. And so, Lord, I thank you for those that give to support the ministries of this church, but also for the gospel to go forward. Would you bless them for their giving today? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And all the people said? Amen. Amen. As our choir makes its way down, we're also going to dismiss our children through the fifth grade to Children's Church. Parents, you can drop them off in the lobby and they will be taken to a time a little bit more age appropriate for them. And then you can pick them up in the education building right after service. But today, I hope you have a copy of God's Word. If not, there is one in the seat back right in front of you. Let me invite you to take that and let's make our way to Genesis. We have been going through Genesis now for about two months. And today we are in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. And we will be going all the way into chapter 7, verse 5. And today, Miss. Deb Arch is going to come and read our passage for us. Deb. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set a door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come with you to keep them alive." Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every little thing, living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground." And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. This is the reading of God's word. Thank you, Deb. Perhaps second only to the Christmas account and the manger, the most popular story and account in all of the Bible is none other than Noah and the flood. 
Now, when it comes to knowing the flood, I have found that there is two kind of extreme ways we can look at the flood. On one hand, you see the flood, almost this idea of this floating zoo with uh, Noah, this joyful and jolly old man there with all of his animals and everyone is smiling and everything is sunshine and rainbows. And if you look at that and uh, the way it is usually drawn in bright colors on children's hallways and nurseries, you might think that Noah just went on some type of an animal cruise through the Caribbean and it was all well and good. That's one extreme. On the other extreme, you find those that would look at a story like Noah's Ark and see it as a angry and tyrannical, wrathful God who is just pouring out his judgment and wrath on sinful mankind. Now, what I have found is that both of those extremes are dangerous because they do not really show us the main idea of what is happening here in Genesis 6 through 9. Because in fact, what I see is that there are two different truths that at first seem to be competing, but really complement each other beautifully. Brandon Smith says it this way, Noah's flood isn't simply a Sunday school story about sunny skies and rainbows. Real people died. Now I want you to sit under the weight of that just for a moment. Real people died. Real sin was punished in a real flood, but at the same time, Noah's life isn't just a grim story about fury and death. Because even though God, yes, did execute judgment, he still showed grace to those who trusted in him. So, two different ideas. Yes, we will see the judgment of God. After the fall into sin, God's good creation comes crashing down. And like a good father looking down on a wayward child, he looks down on his creation sin and is grieved deeply by it. And as a holy and a just God, his holiness is offended. And therefore, yes, we will see his just wrath poured out on sinful man. But at the same time, while sin abounded, grace abounds all the more. Because on the other hand, we will see God's grace that while the world was in sin, God is faithful to provide an escape through Noah and his family in the form of an ark. So next three weeks leading up to Easter, we're going to be unpacking this story of Noah. Today, we're going to zero in on Noah himself and what can we learn from him. The next two weeks, we're going to zoom out, though, and see that the main character of this story is not Noah, it's God. And we're going to see his judgment and his wrath, but at the same time, his faithfulness, his love, and his mercy. But today, Noah. What I want you to see about Noah very clearly throughout this text is that Noah was obedient to God. But what I'm thankful for is that it's not just Noah was obedient because it was easy and it was very rewarding for him. No, we see he obeys even when it was risky and even when it was hard. So let's first just look at the obedience of Noah starting in verse 9. Now, Genesis 6, 9, it says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Now that phrase, these are the generations of, we've already seen it. And in fact, we're going to see it 10 different times all the way through Genesis as a literary device that Moses, who is writing, uses to indicate that this is a new section and shows us that Genesis 6, 9, all the way through the end of chapter 9 is one account that we are to take together as a whole. Now, we see introduced this man by the name of Noah. Noah stands out in a stark contrast to the wickedness of his day. Remember last week, we looked at Genesis 6, 5, as the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Folks, that's one of the clearest verses in the entire Bible that speaks to the total depravity of man, that we are sinful not just externally but internally in the desires of our hearts. But in contrast to that, here we find Noah. And if you want to know in the Old Testament especially what the main point of a text is, notice what is repeated. 
If something is repeated time and time again, you need to take notice of it because that's what the author really wants you to understand. Four different times specifically, the author tells us that Noah obeyed God. Genesis 6, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Genesis 7, 5, Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Genesis 7, 10, speaking of the animals, they went into the ark with Noah as God commanded Noah. Genesis 7, 16, those that entered went in as God commanded them. So if you want to know what Moses is trying to communicate here is that Noah obeyed. He was a righteous man. But notice in verse 1, there's really three layers because there's three statements that speak to the righteousness of Noah. First, it says he was a righteous man. Now, righteousness speaks not just to the external life, but to the internal life. It's not just that Noah did right things, but he desired what was right even in his heart. In his heart, he was a man of integrity, holiness, and and righteousness. You see, the question is not just do you do good things? Are you good? Even in your heart, do you desire what is right? God looks beneath this, the surface external actions, and he knows the deepest desires of your heart, the ones that you would want nobody else to know about. Noah was a man of integrity, purity, and holiness. But secondly, it also says not just that he was righteous, but he was also blameless. So righteousness speaks to the heart. Blameless speaks to the external actions. So externally, he lived, as 1 Timothy 3, Paul says, above reproach. Was Noah perfect? By no means. And yet, as those in that day looked at Noah and examined his life and his pattern of walking, they could find no glaring deficiency in which they could say, aha, I told you he was a hypocrite. In other words, he practiced what he preached. In other words, Noah just didn't talk the talk, he walked the walk. And that's exactly what it says in verse 1, he walked with God. Last week, we heard the same thing about Enoch, who walked with God as a pattern of life. And as a result of him walking with God, Genesis says that he did not meet death. So walking with God led him to have life. 1 John 1, 6 and 7 says it this way. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all righteousness. So the question is, what does it mean to walk with God? Does it mean that we live a perfect life? Well, of course not. Noah was not perfect. In fact, in Genesis chapter 9, we'll see in a few weeks that after the flood, after saying the amazing things that God does, Noah gets slapped drunk and passes out. He is not a perfect man whatsoever, yet he is described as righteous. You see, to walk means as a pattern, a habit of life. His desire was to walk like God. I'll never forget, it was about seven years ago, we were still living in North Carolina, and there one day we got snow. Now, for you snowbirds, this was only about a two or three inches, but to a southern boy, this was an exciting day. We had snow on the ground. Jason, at the time, was only a year or two old at the time. And so I got dressed, Kelly got dressed, and then we dressed him as warmly as we could. We put on all the layers. We put a big blue jacket on him. He looked like just a big blue marshmallow as he was walking outside in the snow. And I'll never forget as we were walking down the sidewalk, I was leaving footprints behind. But what I noticed is that when I turned to look back, what was Jason even at that young age trying to do? Walk in my footsteps. Now, I'll be honest, when you looked at him, he looked absolutely ridiculous doing it. Most of the time, he missed. He was stumbling. One time, he even fell. But if you noticed and watched him, you would know that his desire was to walk like his daddy. Let me ask you, when I look at your life, I can't judge your heart. But if I watched the pattern of your life, who would it be evidence that you were trying to be like? 
Would your pattern of life, your walk of life, be one of walking after the world, or would it be after your heavenly Father, Jesus? I'm not asking, are you perfect, but I'm asking, is your pattern of life one in which you are trying to be like your Lord and Savior? Notice in Genesis 17, 1, God says to Abraham, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Now notice the progression. There's a logic to that verse. To be blameless only happens when we are walking with God, and to walk with God only comes when we know who he is. You see, we can only walk with God not when we know about him, but when we know him and have a personal relationship with him. I want to be clear with that. Because before we get into obedience, I want to be abundantly clear that the Bible teaches that we are saved not by our good works, but only by the grace of God through faith in his finished work on Calvary's cross. We are unable to pay back and be good enough in order to pay back what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We cannot pay it back because it is through Christ that only he has through the work of death on the cross, paid the penalty for our sin, and it is by through our faith alone that his work is applied to us. So we are saved by faith through grace, plus nothing else of our own behalf. You see, I want to be clear with that because the temptation in a sermon like this is that we get into what I would call behavior modification. You've heard preachers preach behavior modification. What is that? It means when I just stand up here and say, you know what, you need to do better. You need to straighten up. You need to come to church more. You need to read your Bible more. You need to pray more. You need to share the gospel more. You need to be a better Christian. And all that's going to do is cause you to be more exhausted and more frustrated. You see, what we need is not behavior modification. You can clean up the external all day long and still be lost, dying, and going to hell. Yesterday, I was doing some dishes by the sink, and I picked up a pot that needed to be cleaned, and there with my hands, I started cleaning the outside of the pot. I had it perfect, spick and span. I could see myself in it. It was clean. And I flipped it over and looked on the inside, and it was still nasty, dirty, and needed cleaning. You see, behavior modification is when I clean up the outside, and yet the inside, my heart is still far from God. Jesus says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. That means when we are saved, it is not just the external self that is saved, but God takes away that heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. I have a new heart within me, and so now I desire to walk after God. I desire to be like my Father. I am not perfect, but I want to be like the one who has saved me. You see, sadly, what I have found When you examine the American church as a whole, is this mindset that I can give my life to Christ, I can repeat a prayer that somehow supernaturally saves me, or I can go through a religious act of walking down an aisle, and then I'm saved. But then I can somehow just go and live however I want to live, and you can't tell me otherwise. Noah shows us otherwise. Noah shows us that obedience does matter. In fact, James 2.17 says, Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It is not a saving faith. So how do we reconcile these two? On one hand, the Bible is abundantly clear that I am saved by my faith, not of my works. But then verses like James couldn't make it any clearer that if my faith does not have works, then it is dead, unsaving faith. Well, I think the answer is simple. We are not saved by our good works, but the evidence that I am saved is that there will be good works. There will be fruit or the result of my faith. Think about it this way. In Hebrews 11, speaking of Noah, it says, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Why was Noah saved? 
His faith in God, just like we're saved. We're saved by faith. He had faith in God, but notice what did that faith result in? Him going and building the ark. It showed that what he professed, he truly believed. His faith led him to go and build the ark. It was the result of his faith. Let me ask you, what would it have meant if God said, all right, or Noah said, all right, God, I believe you. I believe this flood is coming. And yet he went for the next hundred years and just sat by the lake. Just kicked his feet up and said, you know what, that flood's coming, but I'll get to it eventually. It would have shown his lack of works that his faith was not a genuine faith. You see, my concern is that in many churches, maybe even some in this church, we make a good profession of faith, and yet we have no fruit that is evidence of that profession. One of my seminary professors once wrote this equation on the board, and it has forever changed the way I see works in the Christian life. He said it this way, stated belief plus actual practice equals actual belief. What does that mean? Stated belief. You can say whatever it is that you believe. You can say that easily. You can say all day, I love Jesus, I'm a Christian, I've given my life to Him, I've been transformed. But when you add in not just your state of belief, but your actual practice, what you actually do, then you can see what you really believe. You can say all day, I believe in Jesus, and yet live as though you've never even heard the name, then that is an indicator of what you really believe. You see, notice, what is it that causes Noah to stand out amidst this wicked generation. It wasn't just a good profession of faith. It was his blameless life that allowed him to be a lighthouse in the darkness. It's been said that lost people do not read the Bible, but they do read the people who read the Bible. Simply, they are watching us in our conduct of life. They look at us and they hear all day about the love of Christ, the transformation of the gospel, forgiveness, and the love that we have for the world. But the question is, is if they came in this room, would they see it lived out? Or would they see something very different? I love the words of a pastor by the name of Brennan Manning. He says, if you want to know what the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is, He says it's Christians. Did you get that? What is the greatest single cause of atheism? It's not liberal college professors. It's me and you. Say, Pastor, how could that be? Well, he says it is because the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out of the door and deny him by their lifestyle. He says that is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Why is it I believe that the church of America has been on the decline for decades now? It is because for decades now the church in America has not functioned as the church in America. Jesus in Matthew 5 says, let your light shine before others. And we say, amen, let our light shine before the world. And yet what most of us take that to mean is that simply we need to call ourselves Christians, come to church, and and then somehow that is going to let our light shine. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, let your light shine before others so that they might see your what? Your good works. And as a result, give glory to God in heaven. If we want to be a lighthouse in the darkness, our profession matters, but our practice matters as well. Do we practice what we preach? Now, let me be clear. There is a difference between standing against this generation and standing out in the midst of it. I'm not talking about standing against this generation as though the generation out there is our enemies and it's us versus them. That's not what I'm referring to at all. I'm saying we should stand out. That if we are going to stand out and show the world something different, we have to live differently. They have to see something different in us than they see on TV every single night. Noah obeyed and he stood out as a light in the darkness 
But what I'm thankful for in this text is it shows that he did not just obey because it was easy. But notice, secondly, Noah was obedient even when it was risky. Notice in verse 11, it says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark. God sees the corruption. He sees the wickedness. And he tells Noah to go and build an ark that he might be saved from the wrath of God that was to come. Now, I find it interesting, the only other time that word ark in that way is used is actually Exodus chapter 2, when baby Moses is placed in the basket or the ark of safety that would guide him down the waters of the Nile to Pharaoh's daughter. We see here God telling Noah to build an ark for safety from the wrath that was to come. And notice, notice how explicit the instructions are. He tells them to make an ark of gopher wood. We're not completely sure exactly what type of wood that was, but I imagine it was a very strong type of wood. The size of cubits would translate to a boat that was more than 450 feet long, 75 foot wide, and 45 feet high. It would be longer than a football field, three stories high, and a deck space of around 100,000 square feet. That would translate to roughly 500 plus modern day shipping containers, which one scholar said would be enough to hold 125,000 sheep. Now, I just say all that to say, whatever you can think about, about all the animals and and what that would look like and the bugs and the food, all of that stuff, simply to say, I don't know how it all worked, but there was enough room. There was enough room for Noah, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, plus all these animals, plus all the food that they might survive. You see, it was through this ark that the mercy and the grace of God was extended to Noah. And notice in verse 22, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Now, before we move on, I want to camp out here for just a moment Because I want us to consider well how risky this would have been for Noah. What he put on the line. God tells Noah, build a boat, and yet it had not even rained yet. And it would not be for a hundred more years, an entire century, until the flood would come. Yet, he starts building this enormous boat. Could you just imagine what he had to put on the line? Could you imagine how risky it was? From a human perspective, they would have looked on that and said, Noah, you are out of your mind. This makes no sense. He risked ridicule. Noah, what are you doing? Flood, are you crazy? The judgment of God? We don't like talking about judgment. Let's just go and live our best life now. That's never going to happen. Can you imagine as Noah went into town and everyone started looking away? They didn't want to make eye contact. Why? Because there's crazy Noah coming into town again. Mothers would say, hey kids, don't make eye contact with him. That man is out of his mind. He risked losing relationships. I wonder how much of his friends and family turned their back on him. I imagine Noah had a very large family, and yet notice there was only seven family members that would go on the ark with him. He risked time and money. I wonder how much of his own resources did he give to make this a reality? How much time he he gave? He could have spent all that time just sitting on the ocean with his feet up and just enjoying God's creation, but instead he sacrificed his comfort, his ease, his time with his family, his children, so that he could go and obey God. And even more than that, he risked his very life. I mean, could you imagine if he gave all of this and the rain never came? 
If he put all of this on the table, everything he had, and for a hundred years he wasted it all because the flood never came. Yet, for Noah, there was no risk. From the worldly perspective, Noah risked everything. He was foolish. It made no sense. And yet Noah knew there was no risk. Why? Well, I love what John Piper says. He says, risk in our lives come because we don't know the future. If you knew what the future held, you would never have to risk again because you could live in light of that reality. Therefore, he says, God takes no risks. He knows all outcomes before they happen. His omniscience rules out the possibility of taking risks. So, therefore, for Noah, risk was right. Why? Because God was in it. He already knew the outcome of what was going to happen, and therefore to trust in God meant that there was no real risk. Now, I imagine... For someone in this room, God is calling you to obedience. He is calling you to some action, and it scares you. And from a human perspective, all of your friends and family would look at you and say, if you do that, you're crazy. God is calling you to do something that you imagine is risky. And from a human perspective, you're thinking of all the reasons why you should not do that. We're really good at talking our way out of obedience, aren't we? I don't know what it is for you. Maybe for you it is some act of service to someone in your community or some ministry here in the church. And you think, well, I see the needs, but I just don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Or I just don't know if I can give up more of my time. And yet I know God is calling me to do this. Maybe it's a coworker that you have in your heart this burden to share the gospel with, and yet you know that if you do that, you are risking losing your job. Maybe you have come to the beach and you have retired and you're enjoying that season of life, but you feel God pressing on you. No, I need to go on the mission field. Maybe it's like one couple that I know that lives in the Midlands and they retired They were enjoying retirement and they were very involved in their church and yet God began to press on their hearts. Our grandchildren don't know Jesus. Our children aren't taking our grandchildren to church and so they picked up the phone, called their children and said, hey, if we move to your town, would you allow us to take your kids to church? Can I take my grandchildren to church? The kids said yes and so this retired couple picked up sold their home, left what they knew, moved an hour away so that they could be missionaries to their own grandchildren. I don't know what God is calling you to, but from the world's perspective, it looks risky. It seems so big, so much money, so much time. How could I do that? Yet we know the end. We know that one day we will stand victoriously there on the day of judgment. And so if God has called you to do something, make no mistake, he will equip you to it and he will see you through it. What risky act of obedience is God calling you to? As I was thinking through this, I could not help but think of the missionary Jim Elliott. Many of you know his story as he would lay down his life on the mission field as he went to share the gospel with the Aka tribe. From the world's perspective, he was out of his mind. His friends and family said, Jim, don't do it. You will lose your life. And yet he went. At first, there was some positive interactions. But on the day that they were going to go and try to make face-to-face interactions, some of his friends said, you need to take something to defend yourself. You need to take a weapon of some kind because they're going to try to take your life. And he said, no. I said, why? Why would you do that? That makes no sense. He said, it's because I know that if I died today where I would spend eternity, and yet if they lost their life, I know where they would spend eternity also. From a worldly perspective, the risk was enormous. It made no sense. And yet he would go. And we know the rest of the story that he indeed would lay down his life. They would take his life life. And yet, when we look back on his journal, he embodied that very thing when he said, quote, he is no fool 
who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Noah obeyed when it was risky. But also, I love the fact that he obeys when it wasn't easy. He obeys even when it is hard. Verse 1, God calls Noah in chapter 7. He calls Noah and his family and their wives, the sons and their wives, to go and build the ark. Now, what we see, I find is interesting in these first three verses, is that a lot of times when we talk about the animals going into the ark, how do we say they went into the ark? Two by two. But what I find interesting is in chapter 7, that's actually not what it says. It says the unclean animals went in two by two, but actually for the clean animals that there would be seven pairs of clean animals, that they would go in 14 by 14, if you will. And when you think about it, it makes sense. Why? Because they would need more clean animals to eat for food and also to perform sacrifices of worship to God. So we see them going into the ark. But notice what it says in verse 4. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. And every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Now next week we're going to spend more time talking about the judgment of God. But notice how long did the rain fall? 40 days 40 nights. Now, if you think about that number 40, we see it used other times in the Bible. For 40 years, Israel wandered in the wilderness. For 40 days, Jesus fasted and was tempted by Satan. 40 in the Bible is a symbolic number of trial and temptation and hardship, meaning that for Noah, this wasn't an easy time. It was challenging. It was difficult, yet he obeys. He follows God. He obeyed even when it would cost him. To get on that boat, can you imagine realizing that he would leave everything behind? His home, the rest of his family, friends. He would leave it all behind. He obeyed even when he could not see the end. For 100 years, he built this boat wondering, God, when will this flood come? Yet he continued to press on. And he obeyed even when it hurt. I mean, could you imagine from the boat watching as his home was washed away, as friends and family members died, yet he obeyed. Yet he was faithful. For some in this room, I am convinced there are some here today You are trying to do what is right. You are trying to obey. You're trying to start and follow after God. And yet you have found that it is so difficult to do that. You want to obey God, but you say, God, my body just won't even stop hurting. And I just received even more bad news from the doctor. I want to obey God, but I've lost friends as a result of it who no longer speak to me because of that Jesus that I'm following. I want to obey God, but it just seems like every time I take two steps forward, I take five backwards. And sometimes I just don't know, can I keep going? Right now, you might say, I'm trying to follow after God, and yet all I can see is the clouds and the rain. Today, let me encourage you today with Galatians 6, 9, that says, quote, Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Today, I am convinced there is someone here today that you simply just need to hear the words. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep pressing forward. Keep being obedient. Keep being faithful. Because one day you will reap the harvest and you will be able to look back on this season of hardship and you will be able to say on that day, It was worth it. I wanted to give up so many times, and yet I kept going, and I am so thankful that I stayed faithful to my Savior. You see, what I have become more and more convinced of is that what separates the weak, nominal, powerless Christian life from the abundant, rich, abundant, power-filled Christian life is doing the difficult things. It's obeying God even when I don't feel like it. 
Even when everything in my flesh tells me to do otherwise, I obey him and I see his face. Let me ask you today, if we were to examine your life between you and God, and we examine your practice of life, your walk of life, let me ask you, what would it be evident about the profession of your faith? I love the story of a small town in the center part of America. It was said that this was a farming town and that the farmers were going through a long drought. And so it was said that the farmers in this small town were beginning to grow tired and weary because there had not been rain for more than a month. And they were worried about losing their crops. And so one of the local churches in the area decided that one Sunday afternoon they would have a prayer service asking God to send rain on the land. They invited all the farmers in the area and about 50 farmers showed up so that they would pray together for the rain. For an hour, they prayed that God would send rain on their fields. But at the end of the service, the pastor noticed something. He got up and he said, you know, we have been praying for an hour for rain. We have prayed that God would send this as a blessing in our land. But I've noticed something. Fifty of you came to pray that God would send rain. And yet only one of you brought an umbrella. Only one had actual faith that God was going to respond to their prayers. Their faith led to the action. Let me ask you, if I examined your life, what would be the indicator of what you profess? Would the practice of your life support the profession you make in Christ? Because I'm convinced for each of us today, God is calling each person in this room to a step of obedience. For some of you, it's that first step, that first step of just simply surrendering your life to Christ in faith. For the rest of us, he is calling us to an act of obedience. I don't know what that is for you. That's between you and God. But let me ask you today, are you willing to pray a dangerous prayer? God, show me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. What is that next step of obedience that God is calling you to make? Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for this word today. And God, I thank you for the example of Noah, who though living in a very crooked and wicked generation through many hardships, was faithful and obedient. And as a result of that, built the ark that would save his family from the wrath of God. God, I pray today that for each of us, there would be Noahs found in this place and that that number would only increase. That in this place, there would be people that would stand as lighthouses to this generation because they live in such a stark contrast because of their righteousness. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. I don't know how you need to respond today. Maybe you need to come and pray at the front. Maybe you need to pray there in your pew. Pastor Adam and myself will be at the front. And my simple challenge to you as always is to respond as only God would lead. Would you stand and would you sing?
And just want to say thank you again for worshiping with us today. Remember, Surfside Community Ministries interest meeting, five minutes right in here. Um, so if you're interested in that, hang out. We'll start in about five minutes. But as always, we have now gathered as the church. Let's go and be the church. Have a blessed day.